I was sitting at lunch several years ago, and I received a phone call from my wife. She was panicked, she was whispering, and was obviously afraid. The first words out of her mouth were, there are men outside in body armor with guns. So I throw some money on the table, and I run to my car, and I drive home across town as fast as I can, only to get to my driveway and not be able to get into my house because the SWAT team has surrounded the place. So I park, and I walk up, and all I see is about 10 guys up against a wall being interrogated, guns on the ground. This looks like no joke. The guns looked real, the armor looked real, the SWAT team, it looked really real. But come to find out, our senior pastor's son wanted to make a movie. We lived right outside the church in a wooded area, and he thought this was the perfect backdrop for his movie. And I'm telling you, if he produced it, I'd watch it, because it looked like they were about to go on a raid of some sort. It was terrifying. How do we know who the good guys are and the bad guys are? Is it political affiliation? Is it economic status? Is it denomination? Is it the rules they follow or don't? Is it anybody who's playing the Astros? That that game is still going on, by the way. Um, This morning, we're going to be looking at another parable in the book of Luke. We're going to be in Luke 15. You can start making your way there now. Uh, At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's a well-known teacher. He's a healer. He's a miracle worker. And as he moves from village to village, as he goes from town to town, uh, he's got a following. There are really three groups of people that are following him. Some who follow for good reasons. They, They want to follow Jesus. Some who want to go and just see the show. And then there's a considerable group that follows Jesus everywhere he goes, just in hopes that they might see him fail. That last category of people is highlighted by the religious elite, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And I know that we tend to think of these guys as as the bad guys. But I'm convinced if we were around during Jesus' day, we probably wouldn't have seen them that way. They were morally upstanding. These were the people who were trying with every fiber of their being to do the right things. You see, the Pharisees, they knew what happened when Israel walked away from the law, when they disobeyed under kings like David and Solomon. When the people broke the covenant of Moses, bad things always ensued. It wasn't until much later when people like Nehemiah came in to rebuild Jerusalem and Ezra found that old dusty book of law that the people realized why things were in such uh, disorder, why things had gone so badly. So for hundreds of years after that, Israel was deeply committed to following the law to the letter. But as often happens over time, they lost the heart behind the law. They lost their love for God, and they became their own idol of worship. So as we read this parable, we see that these religious elite, these leaders, they're put out with Jesus. He's not what they expected. He doesn't lead the way that they like, and he has the audacity to challenge them. So right here in Luke 15, we see a microcosm of their frustration in their criticism of Jesus. Look on with me. You're starting in verse 1. It says, All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. There is such an important truth right here. Do you notice who Jesus is hanging out with? The lowest of the low. He's hanging out with the tax collectors. Uh, These are the people in Israel who have contracted with the Roman Empire to make money off of their own countrymen. They were known to be crooked, and they were almost universally hated. 
we also see that there are the, this other group of people who's criticizing, who's looking in at Jesus' ministry and looking at it with a critical heart. That's not unique to Jesus' day, I don't think. There's always going to be critics. And incidentally, uh, it doesn't take much intelligence to be a critic. Can we just put that out there? Like to, to find a problem, to poke a hole in something, that doesn't take a whole lot of brain power. Um, but you know what's much more difficult is finding a solution of pursuing the right thing. And that's what we get to see this morning in parables, is that pursuit of what is best. Let's keep reading in verse 3. It says, so he told them, this is Jesus, so Jesus told them this parable, what man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and coming home, he calls his friends and his neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. This parable, it illustrates our helpless state before God. It is not a compliment to be compared to a sheep. Sheep are dirty, they are weak, and they are incredibly dumb. They aren't only prey animals. Sheep don't have any means of defending themselves. They're just, once they're apart from the herd, they're free for the pickings. They're constantly in need of rescue, and they are completely dependent on the shepherd. But what I think is interesting about this parable is we have to notice the care of the shepherd for the lost sheep. He drops everything. And when it's found, he he searches, he finds the sheep, he picks it up, he throws it on his shoulders, he carries it home. And what's more than that, when he gets home, he doesn't just put the sheep up, go to bed, and really hope that the same thing doesn't happen the next day. No, he throws a party, he calls his friends, over one lost, dumb sheep. It's like, no, we're going to rejoice. And then Jesus goes into a second parable, verse 8. Or what woman who has ten coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coins that I lost. I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So this parable, it focuses on a a poor woman. There's no windows in her home. That's why she has to light a lamp to do her searching. She's likely single. Some note that single women would wear 10 coins either on their head or or as a necklace or around their neck. Uh, These these, uh, were a symbol of her character and showed that she had a dowry still to be paid. These coins uh, were so special that there was even a law within Rome that they couldn't be taxed. So if she lost a coin, you better believe she would do anything she could to find it. Have you ever lost something? I think we've all lost something at some point in our lives. And I am completely convinced that the length of time that we are willing to search for a lost item is directly correlated to the value that we place on that item. If you were to lose a common pin, it's probably like chewed up on one end, the cap is gone, right? Everybody has that pin laying around their house. If you lost that pin, how much time would you spend searching for it? Maybe a minute, probably less. But what if you lost your wedding ring? You would look and you would look and you would look until you found it. You'd probably never stop looking for it. Not only are these things expensive, but they also carry with them a very deep meaning. These illustrations would have been offensive to the Pharisees. Shepherds were low-class citizens who did dirty, menial labor. Women in the first century uh, were, at best, second-class citizens. 
in his teaching and in his actions, Jesus is showing us what true love, grace, and compassion look like. Jesus offends the original, uh, um, <clears throat> Jesus offends the religious elite by eating with sinners. He's modeling what it looks like to go to those who are different, those who are outside, those who are lost, those who are far away and overlooked. He's modeling what it looks like to love with more than just some words and intentions, but with actions and relationships. And I think this is the age-old dilemma in the church. How are we supposed to love the people who are in the world without loving the things of the world? How do we extend the kindness and the grace and the mercy of Christ without compromising our own convictions? We see this heart in Jesus over and over in Scripture, a heart that is full of love for everyone, regardless of lifestyle, regardless of action, political affiliation, of background, of socioeconomic status. We are called to have that same love and that same compassion for everyone. So this morning, we are going to see that every person will have more compassion towards people who are away from Jesus when we realize two key things. And that starts when we first realize just how lost we are. Jesus shows us our need in these stories. He shows us that we're lost, but then he gives us hope that we're being looked for, that someone is searching for you. Verse four says, what man among you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? In verse eight, or what woman has 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? There is no stopping the search because the situation is dire. The sheep has wandered away from protection. It's clueless to its surroundings, and it's completely defenseless. The coin is missing in a dark place. It's covered in the dirt of the floor. Both of these situations show hopeless scenarios that are only fixed when someone is faithful to search until it's found. And what I love about these parables is there are layers of teaching and encouragement. So while it's good and and responsible to look for something that you've lost, that's not the main point here. Jesus is communicating through story that he is willing to pursue those who are far from him. He's willing to seek and to scour the pasture until he finds that one who is alone, who is afraid, and who is running away. I'm not sure that Jesus had a personal mission statement like on a wall somewhere. But if he did, I think it would be the words that he spoke to Zacchaeus. You probably remember Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. There's a song about him. Ask your kids. Ask your kids about Zacchaeus. But Jesus sees Zacchaeus. He says, hey, I'm going to come and eat with you. You notice a pattern. Zacchaeus gives his heart to Jesus. And then here are the words that Jesus says. This is the mission statement of Jesus in Luke 19.10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the heart, that's the heart of our Savior, is to seek and to save that which was lost. We see this heart throughout all of Jesus' ministry. He is consistently with the outsider, with the forgotten, with the sinner. He consistently pursues those who are lost. And in our ever-increasing secular culture, even where we live right now, virtually everyone in America, I would say almost for sure in the South, has heard of Jesus and thinks that he's a pretty good guy. Virtually everyone. Most everyone is at least acquainted with a church, whether or not they attend. And most people that you know are really good people. Most people that you know are really good people. There are very few people here with us today who are running around with murderers and drug dealers, right? 
Most people you know are really good people. And because of this, there are far too many people who have a false sense of security when it comes to their salvation. Far too many really good people who just kind of like Jesus. Friends, here's a tough reality check. You cannot be saved until you first realize that you are lost. You cannot be saved until you first realize that you are lost. At the end of this, the parable with the sheep, Jesus makes it very clear that there are none who are righteous. He is even telling the Pharisees in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way at the end of verse 7 that they are lost sheep too. He says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. For in salvation comes only through Jesus. We say this all the time at Kingsland, and I'll be honest with you, we're not going to stop anytime soon. There is no one and nothing else that can save you. But sometimes I get to have conversations with people uh, who say, you know, it's a 21st century. We're in a global world. We have access to all kinds of things, other religions. We can be very sincere in heart. We can have lots of good works. We can go to this religion or that religion. There's face of all kinds and all of these roads lead to God. And friends, that's just not true. The truth is, new ideas when it comes to salvation will get you in trouble. Because we're not doing okay on our own. We're not good people at heart. We are a lot more like the people that Jesus is eating with, like those tax collectors, like those, those sinners who are in desperate need of a Savior. But I think if we're honest, we're also a lot like the Pharisees we have a tendency to think that we're doing a little bit better than we are. We think a little more highly of ourselves than we should. Years ago, former Miami Dolphins coach Don Shula was at the height of his popularity, and he had a really hard time going almost anywhere without people recognizing him, wanting a picture, wanting an autograph, wanting to talk to him. And so after the season one year, he and his wife decided we're going to go way north into Maine to a really small town just to get some rest and relaxation. And it was working for a couple days, and they decided we're just going to go to a movie. We want to do something. We want to get out. So they walk into a movie theater, and as soon as they walked in the door, there were just a few people in there, but every single one of them stood and applauded. Don Shula and his wife, they went and they sat down, a little bit embarrassed. And as the movie was starting to play, he leaned over to the guy next to him and said, man, I didn't think that anybody would recognize me up here in this small town. And the guy looked at him and said, who are you? He said, well, I'm, I'm Don Shula. I'm the coach of the Miami Dolphins. He was like, nice to meet you, Don. Right before you guys walked in, the manager said, if two more people don't show up, we're not showing the movie. So we were just really glad that you guys came. (laughs) Thinking more highly of ourselves than we should, it always leads us to trouble. We will be more compassionate towards other people, especially those who are far away from Jesus when we first realize just how lost we ourselves are. And then secondly, when we realize just how loved we are. I love the rejoicing that we see in both of these parables. We don't see frustration. uh, We don't see relief. What we see is joy when it's found. Look back at verse 5. When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. You see the shepherd's excitement, and it gives us a picture of his heart. This guy calls his friends and neighbors. It's like he's throwing a party all because of this one sheep that he's bringing home. When something that is lost is found, when something that is far away has come near, it is cause for excitement, for joy. 
And friends, that's the heart of our God for the whole world that the lost would be found, that those who are far away are brought near. The most famous verse in all of the Bible is John 3.16. It says, For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You may have memorized that in a different version. God loved the world and he wants everyone to have eternal life, to be with him in a real place called heaven. But so often, as we do with things in the Bible, we quit reading at the end of verse 16. And I believe verse 17 makes this even sweeter. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There is no condemnation in Jesus. There is salvation in Jesus. There is joy. There is hope. There is fulfillment that is found in Jesus. And that is the reason for his rejoicing, that something was lost. Something has been found. It was dead, and it has been given life. That lost sheep, it represents 1% of the herd. I'm from Arkansas. I can even do that math. That's not a lot. 1% of the herd was lost and found. It's carried home. It's celebrated. One single sheep comes home and there is rejoicing and there is a party. Jesus gives a little further explanation. Looking back at verse 7 one more time, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. There is absolutely nothing better this side of heaven than seeing someone come to faith in Jesus. We see here that there is great rejoicing in heaven when that happens. But there should also be great rejoicing in our homes and in this room and in our social circles when we see that happen. Jesus illustrates for us in his actions by eating with the sinners and in these two parables that everyone is a candidate to experience the love and compassion of God. So I want to get real practical for a few minutes here as we close. So how are we supposed to interact with those, those sinners, those outsiders, those who believe and act and live differently than we do in the church? I believe it starts when we see people around us as lost, just like we were lost. And it starts when we see the people around us as dearly loved, just like we are loved. When we see people around us through the lens of what Jesus has done for us and has done in us, it will move us in the direction of the hurting and the afflicted and the sinner with love and great compassion for them. If Jesus loves sinners that much, shouldn't we? Shouldn't that change some of the people that we hang out with? Shouldn't that change some of the conversations that we step into? There's a famous, famous British missionary. That's a hard, those are hard, three hard words to say back to back right there. Famous British missionary. His name was C.T. Studd. He has one of the coolest names of all time. But I love this quote. He said, some want to live within the sound of a church or a chapel bell, but I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. I want that to be my mentality. That was Jesus' mentality. We can see that his heart was broken for the lost around him. If we are called to love the lost around us, and we are, How can our love and our relationships look more like Jesus? I believe that starts when we focus on what Jesus focused on. Over and over again, Jesus modeled for us that the most important relationship that he had was his relationship with the Father. 
All throughout the Gospel of Luke, you can find him stealing away uh, to, to have prayer time, to hear from the Lord, to cry out to the Lord. It's a perfect example for us. Our love for others and our ability to speak hope and truth into their lives, it starts with you individually having a growing relationship with God. That's where our power, our peace, our patience, and our purpose comes from. Having a growing relationship with the Lord. But not only does Jesus have that focus, but he does not run away from tough things. He doesn't run away from tough things. There is a huge difference in loving someone and lying to someone. The most unloving thing that you can do is to know that someone is destined for hell, someone who is walking willingly towards hell, to know that that's the case, to know that you have the solution to their biggest problem and not say anything about it. The most unloving thing that any one of us can do. It's the spiritual equivalent of having the cure for cancer and keeping it to yourself. These parables are an example of Jesus saying hard things to people who are far away from God. But these people, they didn't know that they were far away from God. He isn't mean to them. He isn't ostracizing to them. He simply shares how much they are loved, how dear they are to God, that God of heaven would pursue them where they're at. Illustrating the heart of God and the love that he has for them. The best way to love somebody who doesn't know Jesus is to have a relationship with them. It's to get to know them is to hear their story, is to share your story, to tell them all the ways you've seen God working in your life, all the things that he's done, all the ways that he's challenged you and changed you and blessed you, to share the hope that Jesus has given you. Jesus doesn't show up with a canned gospel presentation, throw it out to some of these tax collectors, and then walk away. He doesn't ignore them. He sits down. He eats with them. And he tells them just how much God loves them. So if you're anchored in the truth, if you're in biblical community, if you're in a relationship with God, you are ready to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. You are ready to be an agent of transformation sent on mission by our God to those who are hurting and dying and lonely and lost around us. But I want to take this one step further. Moms and dads, this is terrifying, isn't it, for our kids? How do you encourage your kids to be salt and light in the world that they're growing up in now, knowing that we're sending them into situations that they need the gospel, but also has the potential to compromise their faith, their convictions, their integrity. Putting them in situations where they're going to be tempted. I think we have two primary means of protection. And I want to encourage every single Kingsland household, every single household on this first one. Two primary ways. Be that house. Every single family can be that house. We need to welcome these interactions in a safe environment, and that is your home. You've heard over and over again that we believe that the home is the primary place of faith transformation, the primary spot uh, where we talk about the gospel, the primary place where your kids are going to see what it looks like to follow the Lord. Growing up, that was my house. We were that house. There were constantly people in my house. In fact, there were a lot of times I would come home from school or I'd be at the store or whatever, and like 10 of my friends are eating my food, they're playing my video games, they're swimming in the backyard, and my parents welcomed that in. It also helped that my mom kept the pantry really well stocked. 
But what this does is it creates a safe place where people of different backgrounds, different beliefs, different habits can come. But parents, what it also does is it gives you just a little bit of the say of how those interactions happen. It lets you speak truth when you hear lies, when those people are right there in your home. And second, we have to model missional living. This was convicting for me this week. Do your kids see you interacting with the lost? Do they overhear conversations about your friend at work who doesn't know Jesus? Do they see you living out before them what it looks like to pursue someone who doesn't know Jesus? If we want to see our kids engage the lost world, turn it on its head and see kids restored by the grace and love of Jesus, that's going to start when they see us engaging with the lost world that is around us. You know what's really funny to me about this passage that we've looked at this morning? Is that the Pharisees give us the perfect description of the heart of Jesus in their criticism of him. You remember what they said? They said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. How dare he? How dare he welcome sinners and eat with them? Folks, that's it. That is the gospel. Let that sink in for just a second. He welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Friends, can we stop approaching Jesus out of fear, out of religion, out of ritual, out of obligation, and realize that he wants to eat with us? Not just us in the church. He wants to eat with everyone. Jesus wants to welcome and eat with every single person on the planet. And what's more than that is he is searching for you. Because of your immense value to him, Jesus is searching for you. So wherever you are, whatever you've done, whatever this last week looked like for you, I want you to know that your Savior is searching for you right now. He left heaven. He's not stuck in a church. He's not sitting on a throne somewhere waiting for you to clean yourself up and try to figure out a way to him. Like the shepherd in the story, he sees one that is strayed one that's run away, one that's afraid, one that is hiding, and he is running toward you. I wonder if anybody is ready to come home today. Maybe this morning you've realized that you have been running from God, that you are that lost sheep. You are the coin that's in the dirt, that's covered up. You feel forgotten and unseen and lonely. Jesus is looking for you, and he is ready to throw a party to rejoice over your return. Today can be the day that you come home. Here in just a moment, as we respond, I want you to know that we're going to have some folks down front. It would be a privilege for any one of us to talk with you, to answer questions about something you've heard this morning, or just to pray with you about things that are going on in your life. But however the Lord is leading you this morning, would you respond? Would you pray with me? Father God, you are so good to us. Lord, it is overwhelming that the king of the world, the creator of the universe, would love me enough that you would pursue me. So God, thank you. 
Thank you for not waiting for me to figure it out, not waiting for me uh, to clean myself up, but you pursued me where I'm at. And so God, I pray for the man or woman today who doesn't feel worthy. Pray for the man or woman today who feels like they're too far gone, that they've been running for so long, uh, that, that there's no way they could be welcomed home. God, I pray that they would hear from you this morning that they are dearly loved and that you want to rejoice over their return. Father, would you have your way with us this morning? It's in the name of Jesus I pray.